right. Good evening, everybody. Let's uh, all stand together and we'll start in prayer this evening. Lord, I thank you um, for letting us be here, Lord, letting us um, participate in just a time to set aside, Lord, to, to think of you and honor you. And um, I just pray that you be with us, Lord. I just pray that you'd fill us with your spirit, Lord. You'd help us to focus on you. Um, I pray that you'd be with Pastor Dan, that you'd fill him with your spirit, give him the words to speak. And um, I just pray that you'd be honored in our worship, Lord. We want you to have all of us, Lord, all of our praise and um so I just pray that you'd come and touch us, Lord, and show us um, in a deeper way who you are, Lord, and, and uh, help our worship to be pleasing to you. And uh, We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. And oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. To this I hold shepherd will defend me and through the deepest valley he will lead and though the night has been won and i shall overcome yet not i but through christ in It has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. And to this I hold my sin has been defeated, and Jesus now and Yet not I, but through 
through Christ in me. And yet not I, but through Christ in me. of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone and your presence of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone and your presence Lord. Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence. God 
is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, the power 
Lord, we do come before you tonight because you are the ancient of days. And Lord, just to be reminded this evening that all time is in your hands and that you are on your throne in heaven above. Lord, you're ruling and reigning in, over this world, over our circumstances tonight. And Lord, we're comforted, Lord, to know that. Lord, we commit this evening to you. We pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to minister among us through your word, Lord. And, and we thank you for your word. And we're excited for your word tonight. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We well, may be seated. Uh, we want to welcome you tonight, those of you that are joining us online. Uh, we're going to be in Ezekiel chapter 38 this evening. If you want to turn there in your Bible for me. Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38 this evening as we are continuing our study through the Old Testament. And let me pray for us one more time and then we'll get into the word this evening. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for your word. And um, Holy Spirit, we ask that you be our teacher tonight and that you would uh, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to your word. That you would speak to us, Lord, that you would give us understanding. Lord, I pray that you would help us to... Um, to understand the days that we're living in through the lens of your scripture. And Lord, I pray and ask that your spirit would be upon me to teach your word this evening. And we pray these things in Jesus name. Amen. Well, Ezekiel chapters 38 and 39 contain uh, one of the, the greatest prophecies in, in the Bible. These two chapters describe a massive invasion of Israel from the north by a confederation of nations and God's supernatural intervention on behalf of Israel. Uh, tonight we're going to just look at chapter 38 and we'll get into chapter 39 next week. But let me begin by giving you just some uh, basic observations before we dig into the text together. Uh, first of all, we've seen that there is a sequence, a sequence uh, of prophecies in Ezekiel that we've studied over the last few weeks. If you remember in chapter 36, God promised that he would restore the land of Israel, the physical land, and make the physical land of Israel fruitful uh, and we talked about that. We, I talked about how as recently as 150 years ago, the land of Israel was desolate wasteland. And then in the late 1800s, uh, Jews began to migrate back to the land of Israel as part of the Zionist movement. They began to uh, farm the land. And today the land of Israel is, is restored. It is fruitful like never before. Uh, Israel now exports food to other nations, and we talked about that. Uh, so chapter 36 has been fulfilled in our time and is being fulfilled in our time. And then in chapter 37 that we looked at last week when we were together, uh, the, there was the prophecy of the Valley of the Dry Bones, the Valley of the Dry Bones, where the, where the bones, after being long dead, are resurrected back to life. And God tells us in chapter 37 that it's a picture of the resurrection of the nation of Israel. Again, we, we've seen that fulfilled. 
Israel was resurrected as a nation in 1948. So chapter 36 was fulfilled literally. And chapter 37 was fulfilled literally. And now we come to chapters 38 and 39 and this invasion of Israel by a confederacy of, of nations. Up to this point in Ezekiel, every prophecy was fulfilled literally. And so we should expect chapters 38 and 39 to be fulfilled literally. We should not suddenly change our approach to the book of Ezekiel and say, well, these prophecies in chapters 38 and 39, they're not literal, they're just symbolic, they're just figurative. No, if, if everything else has been literal up to this point, we should expect chapters 38 and 39 to be literal. For chapters 38 and 39 to take place, Israel must be a sovereign nation again. Uh, and if you remember, Ezekiel writes this to the children of Israel uh, from Babylon. And at this point, as Ezekiel pens this prophecy, uh, Israel is conquered, Jerusalem is destroyed, the Jewish people are in captivity in Babylon. But Israel must become a sovereign state again before this invasion can occur. And so this invasion can only occur after 1948. There's no point in Israel's history previous to the current times that we live in. There's no point in Israel's history historically that the events described here in chapters 38 and 39 were even remotely fulfilled. Uh, the things described in these chapters uh, don't resemble anything in Israel's history uh, at all. So the, these, this prophecy is describing a future invasion of of Israel that is yet to occur. Again, we've got this sequence that has taken place with chapter 36 where the land begins to uh, become fruitful again. That is happening. Chapter 37, you've got the Valley of Dry Bones where the nation is resurrected again. That has happened. And now going into chapter 38, there's this invasion that takes place where God supernaturally intervenes to rescue the nation of Israel. Of Israel. And this is yet to occur. Hasn't happened yet. There's nothing that we can point to that we can say that is the fulfillment of chapters 38 and 39. Now, at the, God tells us the timing of this invasion or when it will occur. I want you to look down at verse 8. So when will it, this invasion occur? Verse 8 says, after many days you will be visited in the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. So here he, God says, in the latter years, this will take place. By the way, this is the only time the phrase latter years is used in the Bible. If you look down in verse 16, you will come, again, um, come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land. So there in verse 16, this invasion takes place in the latter days. So what we're talking about here in chapters 38 and 39, it takes place in the latter days or the, the, the latter years. So what, what does that mean? What is meant by latter years or latter days? Well, biblically, and this is important for your biblical worldview, Biblically, there are only two ages or two periods of time. Now, secular history breaks history down into countless ages. Uh, you've got the Middle Ages, you've got the Enlightenment Age, the Industrial Age, the Space Age, the Nuclear Age, you know, and, and so on. But the Bible breaks history down into two ages. This age and the kingdom age. This age and the kingdom age or the messianic age when Jesus Christ returns and establishes his kingdom here on the earth. When we pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, we are praying 
for this age to end and the kingdom age to begin. In Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse, uh, the disciples were admiring the temple building and how big the stones were in the building and how beautiful the building was. And Jesus said to his disciples, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And in response to his statement, the disciples asked Jesus, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign singular of your coming and of the end of the age? What will be the sign that the last days of this age have begun and we are about to enter the messianic age or the kingdom age? Biblically, there are two ages. This age that we're living in and the kingdom age when Christ is reigning upon the earth. This invasion that's described here in chapters 38 and 39 will occur in the latter days of this age, just before this age ends and the kingdom age begins. So that's when we should expect this battle. Whenever the latter days are of this age, that's when this will take place. So God tells us when this battle will take place in the latter days of this age, just before the beginning of the kingdom age. And God tells us who will be involved in this battle, in this invasion. Look at verse one. So he's going to give names here of who will be involved in this invasion of Israel that will take place in the latter days of this age. In verse one, he says, now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal and prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal. I will turn you around. I will put hooks into your jaws and lead you out with all your armies, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. So this this beginning part of this prophecy is addressed to Gog. We see that in verse two. Now, Gog is a title. It's not a proper name. It's a title for a ruler like king or pharaoh or president. So this is addressed to a ruler, Gog, is the leader of this invasion. He's the ruler, and he is the ruler, we're told, of Magog, Rush, Meshech, and Tubal. Now, the names given here in Ezekiel, these are ancient names of countries that existed in his day, and these countries presumably were well known to Ezekiel, but they're kind of lost on us. We don't have these countries today. They're foreign to us. So what we have to do is to determine the, the where he's talking about, and the countries he's talking about. We have to determine the geographical location of these ancient countries and what countries today inhabit these geographic locations. Because the names of countries change over time, as you know, but the geographic location remains the same. Uh, I have a map at my house on the wall uh, from World War II. And it's a map of the world. And on that map, uh, Israel is listed as Palestine on that map. Because during World War II, previous to 1948, the land of Israel was known as Palestine. That's what it was called at that time. The name was changed from Palestine to Israel, but it's the same place geographically. Names change, geography doesn't change. So the names of these, these, these nations, these countries that are part of this invasion have changed. So where are these countries located geographically? What countries are we talking about? 
Well, this list here in verse 2, Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, and he's going to give some other names here in a minute. Uh, these, these countries today are mainly in modern-day Russia, Central Asia, in the area near the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Uh, this would include many of the Stan countries in Central Asia, like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Uh, th those are all in that area of, of Magog. Um, the, these countries would also include modern-day Turkey. So the, uh, the Caucasus Mountains, uh, the name Caucasus Mountains, uh, it, it, literally, it literally means Gog's Fort. Gog's Fort. It goes back to, to what we're talking about uh, here, and that, that region between Europe and Asia, central uh, you know, area located there between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. And so what we have here is a confederation of nations led by modern-day Russia. Geographically, that's what we're talking about. Modern-day Russia, Central Asia, parts of Turkey, uh, led by Gog, the leader of that, that area. Uh, verse 6 says the invasion will come, if you look down in verse 6, the invasion will come from, uh, from the north. Right? And repeats if you look down in verse 15. Uh, also, verse 15, then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many people with you. So we see that down in uh, chapter 39, verse 2. I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north. So these nation, this nation is, is coming from the far north. To the far north of the land of Israel is Russia. Uh, if you draw a line from Israel directly north, it intersects Moscow. Uh, so we're, we're talking about uh, Russia here, primarily. Russia has a long history of anti-Semitism. Russia has a long history of persecuting the Jewish people. Uh, today in Israel, there is a, a large population of Russian Jews that live in the land of Israel that fled the persecution and the anti-Semitism in, in, in Russia. So some other nations are listed for us in verses 5 and 6. And again, the focus here is on the geography. Where are these uh, places located geographically? The political names of these areas have changed over the centuries. They may change again, but these are the geographic areas involved in this invasion of Israel. Verse 5 says, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shields and helmets, Gomer and all its tro troops, the house of Togarma from the far north and all its troops, many people are with them. So Persia is part of this confederation that invades Israel in the last days after Israel becomes a nation again, which it has. Persia is involved. Now, Persia is modern day Iran. Uh, in fact, uh, Iran's name was changed from Persia to Iran only in 1935, really not that long ago. And Iran just, you know, you, you know we, we probably have li limited knowledge of these nations as they relate to Israel. Uh, Iran was generally pro-Western and pro-Israel up until the Islamic Revolution of the 1970s. Uh, how many of you remember, I don't expect anybody over in that group to raise their hand, but how many of you were alive in 1979? Many of you. How many of you remember the Islamic Revolution of 1979 and the Probably what you remember is the U.S. hostages in Iran as part of that revolution. Well, previous to that revolution in 1979, when, when uh, Islamic ex extremists took over Iran, Iran was pro-Western. They were pro-Israel. So if, if we were reading this prophecy, if we were reading Ezekiel chapter 38, say in the early 1970s or the 1960s, and we would read about Persia invading 
Israel, uh, you know, we would have to say, well, things would have to change very dramatically for Iran to participate in an invasion of Israel. Well, in 1979, things changed very dramatically in Iran. And since then, and especially today, Iran is very vocal about their hatred of Israel and their desire to destroy Israel as a nation. I have a few headlines for you. We've got four images. Uh, so this, this is just from 2019. Iran's unwavering Israel hatred. In this article, it actually says, once a friend to Israel, Tehran, overnight became an arch enemy dedicated to its destruction. 1979, with the Islamic takeover of Iran. Overnight, they became arch enemies of Israel. You can bring up the next picture for it. Uh, this is just from November, uh, November 27th, New York Times article. So we're talking, you know, a few weeks ago. Uh, as Iran threatens payback after assassination, uh, Germany urges restraint. So now Iran is threatening to uh, retaliate against Israel. You can pull up the next one for us. Uh, again, this is from May 2020. Iran's Khomeini vows to destroy Israel. Uh, you can bring up the next one. Iran's supreme leader. This is from May of, of 2020. Iran's supreme leader releases final solution poster and vows to destroy Israel. Uh, the Nazis came up with the final solution for the Jews, which was to exterminate them. And the, the, uh, the supreme leader of Iran is using that same terminology in a poster uh, describing the destruction of Israel. Again, this is just in May. Uh, so this is current affairs. And so, you know, when we look at the scriptures, uh, we want to look at the world through the lens of the scriptures. We don't want to look at the scriptures through the lens of the world. We want to look at the world through the lens of the scriptures. And, and we see here uh, that, that Iran has a, a, a deep hatred for Israel uh, as, as a nation. Uh, again, before 1979 and the Islamic Revolution in Iran, this, this didn't really seem possible or likely because there were friendly relations. So you have Persia, verse 5, and then next you have Ethiopia. Ethiopia here uh, is referring to the land south of Egypt. This would include modern-day Sudan. Modern-day Sudan. Again, we're talking about geographic locations. This would include modern-day Sudan. Sudan has had decades of hostility towards Israel. And we're talking about a confederation of nations that invade Israel, led by the leader of Russia, along with these other nations, Persia, uh, the area of Sudan. Now, if you want to bring up the next picture for us, this is a headline from two days ago. Russia to establish Navy base in the Sudan for at least 25 years. This is just from December 8th. So Russia is establishing a Navy base in the Sudan. And Ezekiel 38 tells us that that area where Sudan is located, along with Russia, uh, will be in a confederation together and invade the land of Israel. Next, you have in the list Libya. Again, this is geographic, ancient Libya. This refers to the land west of Egypt or northern Africa. Next, in verse 6, you have Gomer. That's not Gomer Pyle. Don't think of Gomer Pyle. That's what I usually think of. Uh, Gomer is modern-day Turkey. Togarma is mentioned next, also modern-day Turkey into the area of Armenia as well. So, so what about Turkey? What about the modern state of Turkey? Well, Israel became a nation in 1948, as I've said. In 1949, the very next year, Turkey became the first Muslim-majority country in the world to recognize Israel as a state. And Turkey and Israel had good relations up until about a decade ago. 
Uh, in fact, in 2009, Israel's president, Shimon Peres, was invited by Turkey's president to address the Turkish parliament. 2009, the president of Israel addresses the Turkish parliament. But since that time, especially since 2010, the relationship between Turkey and Israel has become tense. I have a couple more headlines for you. If you want to pull up the next two images for me. Turkey is increasingly becoming a threat to Israel. This is from the Jerusalem Post from July of this year. Uh, you can bring up the next image for us. Uh, Turkey's president, whoever is on Israel's side, we are against them. Again, this is from last year. Uh, so you, you see there's tension rising between Turkey and, and Israel. But 1949, Turkey was the first Muslim country to recognize Israel as a nation state. If you, if you go back 20 or 30 years or more, Turkey and Israel had good relations, and it seemed unlikely that Turkey would ever be involved in an invasion of, of, of Israel. Again, 20, 30 years ago, you would have concluded, well, things will really have to change in Turkey for Turkey to invade Israel. Things have changed. Just in the last 10 years in Turkey, things have changed and turned against Israel. So in this confederation, among the nations that are part of this confederation, you have Russia, you have Iran, and you have Turkey joining forces with some other nations that are, that are mentioned here. And it's, and it's just in recent history that these nations have come together and joined forces. They've never come together before at any point in, in history. In fact, at many points in history, you would look and see and say, I, I can't see how Turkey and Iran and Russia would ever come together. But they've come together now. Um, I have a couple more headlines for you if you want to bring up the next two images for me. Uh, again, this is from July of 2020. Russia, Iran, Turkey say Israeli strike in Syria is destabilizing. Leaders condemn, condemn the Jewish state. You can bring up the next one. Look at this one. Uh, Putin, Russia, uh, uh, Putin, Russia in its place, Israel's pipeline will foil Moscow. Uh, you, we'll talk about that one in a minute. You can, is there another one that you have, possibly? No, okay, never mind. <laughs> so anyways, there is, uh, there, there is a... Uh, a joining of forces of Russia, Iran, and Turkey. And by the way, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, all three have troops in Syria right now on the Israeli border. And we're talking about an invasion of Israel by these nations. Uh, so we, we see this coming together as never before in all of human history. You go back 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, uh, and you can't see how these pieces will come together. And now it's real easy to see how these pieces could come together and these nations could come together. So now that brings us to verse 7. And verses 7 and 8 answer the question as to where this invasion will take place. Look at verse 7. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them after many days you will be visited. In the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel. That's a key phrase. Which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations and now all of them dwell safely. So this invasion will take place in the land of Israel and more specifically on the mountains of Israel. Now, just to tell you a little bit about the geography of Israel, uh, the mountains of Israel run most of the length of the center of the country. So they, they run from north to south down the center of the country, kind of like a spine down the middle of the country, similar to the Appalachian Mountains or the Rocky Mountains in our country. 
Now, here's the thing, though. The modern state of Israel became a nation, 1948. But it wasn't until 1967 and the Six-Day War, uh, but I should say up until 1967 and the Six-Day War, almost all of the mountains in central Israel, almost all of the mountains were part of Jordan. They belonged to Jordan, not to Israel. It wasn't until the Six-Day War, 1967, that Israel gained uh, the, those mountains, the, the mountain range. You know, sometimes you hear politicians talk about uh, Israel going back to their 1967 borders. Well, the, those borders would include Jordan possessing kind of the, the middle part of the country, the central part of the country, including the central mountains, those belong to Jordan up until 1967. So it's only since 1967 that Israel has possessed the mountains of Israel. And, and here it's talking about this invasion of Israel on the mountains of, of, of Israel. Again, if, if we go back to a time before 1967, we go back to 1966. And we look at this prophecy and these invading armies invade on the mountains of Israel. We would say, well, the mountains of Israel, they aren't in Israel. They're, 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 part, of, they're part of Jordan. But since 1967, the mountains of Israel have been part of the state of Israel. So since then, it's possible. Now, look at verse 8 again. Look at this description of Israel. Verse 8 describes Israel as a land... Brought back from the sword, a land that is gathered from many people, currently Jews from 80 to 90 nations have migrated to Israel. They've been brought back from many people. A land whose mounts, mountains had long been desolate, meaning they're no longer desolate. The mountains of Israel have been settled, they've been uh, developed. There's cities in the mountains, farms in the mountains, industry in the mountains. And it says, and now the people dwell safely. And the idea here was safely is confidently. Confidently. Israel is confident in their ability to defend themselves against their enemies. Just listen to Benjamin Netanyahu talk about their ability to defend themselves. They are confident. And their ability to defend themselves against their enemies. And that's the idea here. With they dwell safely. All of these statements in verse 8 are true about the modern state of Israel. They could not be said about Israel at any other point in their history since Ezekiel wrote this. But it could be said today. Look at the description of this invading army in verse 9. You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud. You and all your troops and many peoples with you. So this invading army is going to move across the land like a storm, just swiftly moving through the land. Verse 10. Thus says the Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. So this invasion will be premeditated. It's a, it's a coordinated surprise attack against Israel. A surprise invasion coordinated with these different countries. Has that ever happened before? Sure, it happens. happened before. Yom Kippur War coordinated. It. There's been many attacks like this against Israel in modern history. You will say, verse 11... I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely. They, they, they think they are confident in their ability to defend themselves. All of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. And here's the reason why. To take plunder and to take booty and to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against the people gathered from the nations, again, 80 or 90 nations, who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst 
of the land. So the reason for this invasion is, is told in verse 12. The reason for this invasion is to take plunder and to take booty. These invading nations will be seeking to take something uh, that Israel has. But what exactly they will want is not spelled out for us in the text. It doesn't tell us what it is. But it, it's something of value that these nations led by Russia wants. And there's been a lot of speculation as to what these invading nations will want to take that Israel has. One thing it could be is natural resources. Israel has a lot of natural resources, including natural gas. Israel has a huge natural gas reserve that's just been discovered in recent time. And Israel is currently in the process of building a pipeline to Europe to provide natural gas to the European nations. Currently, Russia is the number one provider of natural gas to Europe. So this is going to cut into Russia's profits and Russia's business and their stronghold on the European nations as their only natural gas supplier. You can bring up that last headline again for us. Putin, Russia, in its place, Israel's pipeline will foil Moscow. Israeli natural gas pipeline to Europe is set to break the Kremlin's stronghold on energy. That's from August of 2020. So again, it's just speculation, but it could be that Russia invades to take over the natural gas because of the impact it's happening, that it has on uh, Russia. We, we, we don't know. It's just speculation. But there is a reason. There's something that Israel has that Russia wants. And so they're going to invade and they're going to lead this invasion for that, that purpose. And it's going to be a surprise invasion to get something that they want that Israel has. Question, has Israel or has Russia ever uh, invaded another nation unprovoked and annexed it? How about 2014 in Ukraine, right? Russia under its current leader has a history of doing this. Now in verse 13, a second group of nations are listed. This second group of nations they protest the invasion, but they don't get involved militarily. Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, and to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? So these nations, they protest this this invasion, but they don't get involved in it. They just condemn it, but they don't get involved. Sheba and Dedan are both in the Arabian Peninsula. So some of the Arab states will denounce this attack on Israel. Uh, this is one of the things that made the Abraham Accords uh, so interesting. Abraham Accords that were signed recently under President Trump that normalized relations with some of the Arab countries and Israel. Uh, because some of these Arab countries are going to condemn this, this invasion of Israel. You know, some of the Arab countries like Saudi Arabia are also targeted by Iran. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel have a common enemy in, in Iran. And like the saying goes, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Right. And so uh, some of the Arab nations have begun to align themselves or at least taken the first steps towards aligning themselves with with Israel. Again, lining up here with Ezekiel 38. Tarshish is mentioned here in verse 13 with all of her young lions, which refers to all the countries that have come out of Tarshish. Now, the location of Tarshish isn't isn't clear uh, some believe it's in modern day Spain. In fact, I think the majority of scholars believe it's modern day Spain. Uh, some uh, uh, believe it was England. Uh, if that's the case, the young lions uh, would include uh, the United States. Uh, but again, most scholars say it's located or it was located 
in, in Spain. Wherever Tarshish was located, this group protests the invasion, but they don't get involved beyond a protest. They're not going to put boots on the ground. They're not going to send troops in. Uh, you know, they're not going to get involved militarily. No nation will come to the defense of Israel when this invasion takes place. Again, you'll have no nations that are condemning it. You might have the United Nations passing a resolution condemning it. But nobody's going to get involved in trying to stop it and stop this invasion. And we've seen a lot of that, right? Uh, with Ukraine, with Syria, just where... You know, nations limit how much they want to get involved in some of these things. Uh, verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to God. Remember, he's the leader, the ruler. Thus says the Lord God on that day when my people Israel dwell safely. Will you not know it? Then you will come from your place. Gog will come from your place out of the Far north, far north of Israel is Russia. You and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes." Uh, these invading armies will come into Israel from the north. They'll come in to the mountains of Israel. They will be like a cloud, like a storm moving across the land. They will experience swift success initially. But all of this is so God will be glorified in the eyes of all the nations. It's so that God will be glorified in the eyes of all the nations Verse 17, thus says the Lord God, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them? And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath, I have spoken surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth and all men who are on the face of the earth. Note that all men who are, are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence, the mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. God says here, I'm a jealous God. God is jealous for his wife, Israel, and God himself will supernaturally intervene and rescue Israel. How will he do it? He will send a great earthquake that will destroy the invading armies, and everyone will know that it is the Lord's doing. Everyone will know. It says that all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. Everybody's going to know this is God. Nobody's going to think, well, it, it's, just, it, it's just a coincidence that there was an earthquake as these armies are invading the land, uh, or that this is a you know, global warming, or whatever they're going to, you know, none of that's going to happen. They're going to say, this is God. This is this is mighty God, almighty God intervening and sending this earthquake to defend his wife, Israel. By the way, uh, the, the great African rift extends up from eastern Africa into the land of Israel through the Jordan Rift Valley. There's this giant tectonic rift under Israel. Uh, and they've had lots of earthquakes in the past. It goes on to say, not only that, when this happens, I, verse 21, I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, the mountains of Israel, says the Lord God, and every man's sword will be, will be against his brothers. So a civil war will break out among these invading soldiers. 
There's going to be this earthquake. You're going to have the civil war break out among the invading soldiers themselves, uh, which is maybe not so surprising when you consider the differences in these nations that have joined forces in such a wide variety of, of, of nations and with, with different political motives. You know, I, I, Iran wants to just wipe Israel off the map, you know, and Russia wants to take something that they have. And so they, these different nations, they come together, they're fighting together in this confederacy, and, and then it, it all starts to unravel and fall apart, and these nations start fighting against each other. Verse 22, and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence, you know, disease, and bloodshed. And look what it says, God speaking, and I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Has God ever sent flooding rain upon the earth before in history as a form of judgment? Yes, Noah's flood. Has God ever rained fire and brimstone down from heaven before in history as a form of judgment? Yes, Sodom and Gomorrah. And God will do the same to these invading armies on the mountains of Israel. They will invade the land like a storm, but God will unleash a storm upon them. And supernaturally defeat the invaders on the mountains of Israel. Thus, verse 23. Thus, I will magnify myself. And I will sanctify myself. And I will be known in the eyes of many nations. It doesn't say those many nations will repent and believe on the Lord. It just says that God will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. This overwhelming supernatural defense feet of Gog and his allies will be a testimony to the world. It will be a testimony that God is real, that God is powerful, that God is for his people Israel and for his land Israel. And God says that this invasion will take place in the latter times of this current age at the, the latter times of this age that we're currently living in just before the kingdom age begins. And as we look at this description in chapter 38, we'll look at chapter 39 next week. We, we see that many of the things that are described in this chapter are already taking place. We'll talk more about this invasion next week when we look at chapter 39, we'll talk more, you know, in detail about the timing uh, of, of this invasion. Uh, but this is something that could happen at any time. It could happen at any time. You know, chapter 36, the land will become fruitful. And we can say the land has become fruitful. Chapter 37, the valley of dry bones comes back to life and is re resurrected and we, we can say the nation of Israel has been resurrected as a nation. Chapter 38, you have this uh, group of nations that spring a surprise attack on Israel and invade Israel. And God will come to their defense supernaturally and rescue them supernaturally. Uh, and, and all these things are lining up. And you could check the headlines tomorrow and find that Russia has invaded Israel and that these armies are on the move into the land of Israel, just coming right. They're already in Syria. You know, when you go to when you go to Israel, you you can go up on the Golan Heights uh, and you can look over into Syria. It's right there. And these armies are already in Syria, and you could wake up tomorrow morning and read the headlines that Russia and Iran and Turkey have come across the Syrian border into the land 
of, of Israel. And all of these things are lining up like never before in history. And for the first time in history, we can really point to these things and say, well, well that's been fulfilled or I can see how that is being fulfilled uh, in, in our time. Israel's a nation again. These alliances are coming together like never before. The, the stage is set. And God said, this is what's going to happen in the latter days. Before the kingdom age. Which is just a sign to us that we are living in the latter days. We are coming to the end of the age. And Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for this chapter. And uh, Lord, the hope that they, that they give us, Lord, and the encouragement and the excitement that this chapter gives us, Lord. And you tell us in your word when we begin to see these things come to pass to look up because our redemption is drawing near. And so, Lord, I pray that uh, this chapter would cause us to look up and be watching and ready for you to come for your church and come for us. And Lord, we thank you and we praise, pray these things in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great night and great weekend. See you Sunday.